Um, I'll have your exams to give back to you uh, on Wednesday. Uh, as a class, actually, you guys did pretty well. The class average was a B. Um, nobody failed the exam, right? The lowest grades were Bs. So, um, by and large, you did fine. I mean, I have noticed, and sort of, you know, take this as you will, I have noticed, um, by and large, uh, as semesters have gone by, a very, very strong correlation uh, between attendance and exam performance uh, in my uh, 2000 level classes. Uh, so, you know, that tended to hold true here. Those of you who show up more often tended to do better on the exam. Um, and I think this is because we draw the exam material directly from the class lectures. Um, so, yeah, I mean, by and large, like, you know, nobody, nobody's in any, in any trouble regarding the exam thus far. Like, you, everybody did more or less all right, and it's worth 10 points out of 100, right? So even if you didn't do as well as you'd hoped, um, you know, all is not lost yet. So the paper is due tonight at midnight, right? Everybody knows how to turn it in as well, right? Upload it to the Dropbox on Georgia View, just the one that says midterm paper. And um, I should have all of those graded uh, by the beginning of next week. Is next week fall break? This, this week is fall break. Yep. Yep. So you don't take them hard copies of the paper. Yeah, yeah, don't, yeah don't, don't, don't give me a hard copy of the paper. Um, I, um, I, I walk to and from work, so carrying a pile of, uh, you know, 60 papers back and forth uh, becomes a little bit onerous. Uh, so yeah, so we, I, I just grade the papers online. So yeah, just upload it to the Dropbox, um, and that should do it. Okay, so any questions about the paper, the exam, about midterm grades, about anything? Paper? Yes. Do you um, want to see page numbers? You don't have to. You can if you want to. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, like, it's bit, like, especially given that you're turning it online and like I don't have to keep a bundle of papers together, I'm not that worried about it. But yeah, if, you, if it makes you feel good, do it. Secret. Okay. Um, one, what tense do you want to hit? So we're talking about present. Present tense. Academic writing is just about always done in present tense. Yep. And the other one is, I know you said four to five pages. Is there a penalty if you go over five? It depends on how much over five you're going. Um, yeah, if it's like five and a half pages, uh, that's that's okay. Um, if you find yourself going to like seven, then you're probably wrestling with something that's too big for this paper, and you might want to scale back your ambitions a little bit. But yeah, if it's like five and a half pages, that's no big deal. Yes, Regan. How do you quote a quote? Um, so you mean how do you quote someone who's quoting someone else? Uh, hmm. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> um, Another question, similar to that. How do you quote a play when they're speaking? Okay, that's easier. <laughs> so let's let's start with that. Um, okay, so if you're quoting from, say, like media. media, yeah. So what you want to do is you just you know capital letters. The character's name. Blah blah blah. I hate I hate you, Jason. Blah blah. Right? That's all you do. You have just character's name first. In quotation marks. the quote. Yes, in quotation marks. Now, if you're quoting a quote, um, that really has. Uh, can you give me an example of what you're trying to do, Reagan? Okay, in Gilgamesh, when he says, if I fail on the way, I'll establish my name, Gilgamesh is going to battle with Gershon Bravo. Okay, so, so you're quoting just Gilgamesh's own words. Yes. Okay, so yeah, you, you would actually just quote that the way it appears 
in the text. There's right. So quote. Right, Gilgamesh saith. Kumbaba, thou sucketh. And so just one, and then two at the very end. Yeah. That's what Yeah. Yes. Um, would you put the name for the play, the, the Medea, would you put that in quotation marks? No. No, um, so you put Medea, quotation mark, what she says, and then quotation mark at the end of the period. Uh, yeah, the, 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 when, I, when, you're, when you're providing your citation at the end, right, that's always just going to be author name, page number. Or if you don't know the author name, put the title of the text in italics, right? Can we shorten the title? Yeah, you can, sure, yeah, you can sort of like to say ep, you know, Gilgamesh rather than Epic of Gilgamesh every time, yeah. Yeah, uh, Jalen, you would... I've got it. Okay. Yes. And so, like, on the work side of page, though, we, we do the actual book, right? Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah, yeah. Cite the, uh, cite the particular text you're using from this book. Yeah. Yes. Would you put the quotation, would you put the citation, like, like after the quotation, or would you put it within the quotation? After? It, it's, it's after. Yeah, okay. it's after the market. Right. Okay. Yep. Yes. When you're doing a quote and tell a quote, you basically do three quotation marks, right? Yeah, you do, do double on the outside, single on the inside. Yes? So every time you reference the text title, it's mm -hmm. always italicized? Yeah, it should, be, um, it should be italicized or underlined, right? The usual convention is if you're talking about a play or a novel or a long narrative poem, basically any long unit of text or you know, a film as well, you underline or italicize the name. If you're talking about a short story or a lyric poem, something small, then you put the name in quotation marks. Yes, you had a hand. Yours was up first. <laughs> I, I will only read the latest one that you turn in. Okay. So if you if you have already turned something in and you want to keep and you're not satisfied and you want to keep working, I'm only going to read the latest one you turn in. So yeah, you know, so long as it's in before 11:59 tonight, that's what'll count. Yes, Jalen. Yep. Yes, sir. No, if you're starting like in the middle of a sentence or that sort of thing, then you put ellipses to show you've left something out. Yeah, if you're just like cutting out a chunk, like and you're, like you're say and you know beginning and ending in the middle of a sentence, then you use ellipses to show you've left something out. But yeah, just just yeah, just quote the just quote as it appears in the text as a general rule of thumb. Okay, anything else? <laughs> when we're citing the, the thing, the story, text. Yes. So do we include that it's from the anthology? Yes, include that it's from the anthology, right? So you, so you know, your citation would still be like Euripides, Medea, but it would be, you know, then like, so, you know, in Norton Anthology of World Literature, third edition, blah, 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 right? Um, if you have any questions about how to cite something, the best place to go is the Purdue OWL website. Yeah, I went there and I was kind of confused about the anthology part, like which part it would be, since it was the epic, would it be under like the oh, story part? Oh, okay, like, come, be, like, okay, come ask me about that after class okay, and we'll okay, really sort it. Thanks. Okay, um, anything else before we move on? Okay, then let me just briefly tell you a little bit um, about the music that we've been playing. Um, I heard they call it the Peacocks. Yeah. Too much in the last few days. Oh, okay. 
I'm sorry to hear that. What? I just to give a PowerPoint for my computer applications and put stuff to do with the key cards and you have to put all these videos and stuff into it. Okay. And then um, has key cards. Yay, So, <laughs> the reason I was playing this for you was as a reminder that most epic is meant to be part of a musical performance, right? It's not meant to simply be read or spoken, right? It's usually chanted or sung. Um, it often serves, as this particular, particular text does, some kind of ritual function, right? Some kind of religious function. So the instrumentation you're hearing there, right? On the one right here, you're hearing flutes, you're hearing a hand drum called a tabla. No, tabla. <laughs> Different thing. And the other instruments, I don't know, everybody's a little punchy today. I don't know what's going on. Um, I like to sleep on everybody's part, I think. Yeah. Anywho, the other sounds you're hearing, you, you're, the, the buzzing, droning sound that you're hearing is an Indian instrument called a tanpura. And a tanpura is a, set, a board with a couple of strings on it. And you play the strings by rubbing them, and they sort of make a buzzing sound. And the lead string instrument you're hearing is called a sitar. And it's a kind of large lute. You know, like the musician sort of sits it up in his lap, and he plays it um, not with a pick, but with a feather. Um, if you've ever heard, like, any of like uh, the Beatles or the Rolling Stones experiments with Indian music from the 60s. Um, the sitar is probably is the one Indian instrument that's made its way into uh, Western music in any meaningful way. Is that a tanpura or a tanpura? T-A-N-P-U-R-A, tanpura. Oh. Okay, T-A-N-P-U-R-A. And these are the conventional instruments of Indian classical music, which, as you probably know, like doesn't follow really Western scales or modes at all, right? It's following its own musical. Pardon? Lute, L-U-T-E. What is a lute? Ever seen El Dorado, the old Disney movie? No. Okay, it's. Well, it's not a Disney movie. Yeah, it, 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 it's, 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 it's similar to a guitar, yes. It's not unlike a guitar. Yeah, but much bigger. So what did they make the peacock noises with? Voices. Those are voices. Yeah. Those are, yeah, the, yeah the, those are just human voices. Okay, so I know that this is uh, difficult material. Um, it can be really hard to get your head around, especially since, again, we're looking at this in excerpts. We're not actually reading the whole thing because the whole thing would be too long. Um, so what I'd like you to do as we start discussing this, could you just tear off a little corner of paper and write your one word response to what you read? Anything at all, right? This is completely anonymous. Yep, this one, yep. Uh, as tiny as you can write a word on. <laughs> so maybe we just one word as far as how you feel. Just get one word that sums up your reaction to this text. Wait, what do we do with it? Pass it up. Do we need to fold it? Not, um, if you want to. <laughs> Not necessary. Lots of big words. Um, <laughs> 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 
turn something in here, yes? Okay. So let's see what we've got here. Okay. Interested. War. Indeed. Confused. Confusing. Confused. Difficult. Interesting. Steady mind, I said one word. <laughs> Confusing. Confused. All right, I, I noticed a, a pattern developing here. Enlightening. Confused. Confusing. Different. And confused. Okay, so yes, Ty. <laughs> okay, so what was the word you meant to put? Rebirth. Rebirth. Okay, yeah. That uh, actually has a lot to do with what's going on here. Um, yeah, go ahead. The only part I understood was the yoga part. Yoga. Yeah. Okay. Then let's, let, let, let's go there. What, 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 what do you think is going on in the yoga part? Um, well, I'm actually in yoga. Okay. Kinda understand what you're saying. And I made notes. I was just like, um, he was talking about purified mind and blocking out distractions and uh -huh. accepting your body and capabilities and focusing on yourself and knowing around you basically. Yeah, essentially what yoga means in Sanskrit is discipline. So when he's talking about, when Krishna is talking about yoga, he's not necessarily talking about, um, you know, putting your body into various difficult positions. Um, that's one way of achieving discipline of doing yoga. He is talking more about this kind of mental discipline, like putting yourself into a particular mental state, which can be related to your physical state or not. Um, but yeah, so that yeah, discipline is a big part of this. Discipline is a big part of Krishna's message here. Yes. Um, is this where um, yoga could have been derived from, like the mm. idea of Arjuna? Oh no, they've been they've been practicing um, the physical form of yoga um, in India for for centuries and had been um, for some time uh, before this was composed. Um, so yeah, so, so that, that would have already been in existence. In fact, um, this is actually um, a big kind of sticking point among, uh, like between devout Hindus and Westerners who practice yoga. For um, devout Hindus, yoga is in fact um, a form of uh, religious devotion. Um, it's an act of worship uh, for the god Shiva who is, um, we'll talk a little bit more about she, who Shiva is um, in a moment, uh, but suffice to say, like, um, Shiva is the sort of god who is um, pleased by attempts to transcend your fleshly state. Um, so you put yourself into various kinds of difficult, painful, kind of mortifying positions um, in order, as an act of worship. And Westerners using this as exercise um, actually gets a lot of devout Hindus kind of cheesed off. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, hey, I, I, I go to yoga classes myself. I'm not saying don't do it, but there is sort of part of the, it, it's part of a sort of larger um, discourse of imperialism and appropriation of sort of, you know, 
essentially Europeans going into a particular country, seeing a thing, misunderstanding it, and appropriating it for themselves. Um, that's sort of where that kind of sticking point comes in. Those of you who found this text really confusing, what made it so difficult for you? What made, the, what made this hard? What were you having a hard time grasping? It's going from like war to reverb to uh -huh. yoga. Okay, and, the, and, and the, <laughs> these, the, these things. Okay, and these things are actually much more closely related here than they might at first appear. So, what's our basic situation here at the beginning of the poem? What's happening at the very beginning of the poem? Two armies are about to meet in battle. Yes, yeah, so two armies about to fight, right? And we're focusing on a single warrior on one side and his charioteer. Right. Now monkey bannered Arjuna, seeing his foes drawn up for war, raised his bow, that son of Pandu, as the weapons began to clash. Then he said these words to Krishna, Lord of the earth, unshaken one, bring my chariot to a halt between the two adverse armies, so I may see these men arrayed here for the battle they desire, whom I am soon to undertake a warrior's delight in fighting. I see those who have assembled, the warriors prepared to fight, eager to perform in battle for Dhritarashtra's evil son. When Arjuna had spoken so to Krishna, O Bharata, he, having brought their chariot to a halt between the armies, in the face of Bhishma, Drona, and the other lords of the earth, said, Behold, O son of Pritha, how these Kurus have assembled. And there the son of Pritha saw rows of grandfathers and grandsons, sons and fathers, uncles, in-laws, teachers, brothers, and companions, <coughs> all relatives and friends of his in both of the assembled armies. And seeing them arrayed for war, Arjuna, the son of Kunti, felt for them a great compassion, as well as a great despair, and said, O Krishna, now that I have seen my relatives so keen for war, I am unstrung. My limbs collapse beneath me, my mouth is dry, there is a trembling in my body, and my hair rises bristling. Gandiva, my immortal bow, drops from my hands, and my skin burns. I cannot stand upon my feet, my mind rambles in confusion. All inauspicious are the signs that I see, O oh handsome-haired one. I foresee no good resulting from slaughtering my kin in war. So he doesn't want to fight. Yeah, he does not want to fight. Right? He shows up ready for battle, and he looks out across the field, and what does he see? People he knows. People he knows, people he loves, right? Friends, relatives, teachers people he's known all of his life. Not only on his side of the army, but on the other. And he does not want to fight these people, right? He does not want to kill people he cares about. And this seems to us a noble and honorable thing, right? That here's this, you know, he's, you know here's you know, this warrior who throws down his bow and arrows and refuses to fight because he will not kill people he loves, because he will not kill his own relatives. Does the poem, yeah, go ahead, Devin. Um, aren't they fighting over land? Or? Yeah, it's, it's, it's complicated, <laughs> but a little bit of context might be helpful here, so I'm glad you actually bring that up now. So the Bhagavad Gita is part of a much longer epic. In fact, probably a much older epic. Um, the, the Gita itself was probably added later on for reasons we'll get to in a moment. But it's a small part of a lengthy epic called the Mahabharata. Isn't the longest epic in history? Probably. Um, yeah, it, it's the, the Mahavarta is enormous, and much of it is concerned with the conflict uh, between two families. Uh, they're really two branches of the same family. Uh, the Pandavas and the Kauravas. K 
K-A-U-R-A-V-A-S. The Pandavas are five brothers who are legally sons of a king named Pandu, hence Pandava. However, um, their father was cursed. Um, he was out hunting, and uh, he shot an arrow into the bushes at what he thought was a deer. And it turned out that what he thought was a deer was actually a Brahmin, a priest, um, having intercourse with his wife. Not the Brahmin's wife, not Pandu's. Um, <laughs> so, as the, Bra as the Brahmin lay dying, he cursed Pandu that if Pandu were ever to have intercourse with his own wife, he would die too. So Pandu, thus cursed, uh, marries a woman who has the power to invoke um, devas or gods. There are two kinds of spiritual, two major kinds of spiritual beings in Hindu belief. Devas are gods and asuras are demons. Devas aren't necessarily good and asuras aren't necessarily evil in the way we would understand it. Um, but yeah, these are sort of the two major types of being. So, Pandu's wife, Kunti. This is why Arjuna is referred to often as son of Kunti. It's his mother's name. Invokes uh, four times a deva to father a child upon her. So her eldest son, Yudhisthira, is the son of Yama, the judge of the dead. The guy who enforces the rules. How do you spell it? Can you repeat that? Which name? Y-U-D-H-I-S-T-H-I-R-A. The second son, Bhima, is the son of the wind god, Vayu. V-A-I-U-I-V-A-I-Y-U. The third son, Arjuna, with whom we are most concerned today. Is that Bhima? A R which which one? B H I M A. It's hard to say because it's faded. Yeah, the, the markers aren't very good. Let's see if this one's any better. Arjuna is the son of Indra, the storm god. And then the last two sons are twins, Nakula and Sahadeva. And they are the sons of a pair of twin gods called the Asvins, who are star gods. Now, all of these gods belong to uh, what is called the Vedic religion. So they actually predate modern Hinduism. The relationship between the Vedic religion and Hinduism is similar to the relationship between, like, say, the ancient Israelite religion and modern Judaism, right? It's not quite the same thing. It's a sort of precursor kind of base. So we call it the Vedic religion because its basis is a series of very long poems called the Vedas, which were transmitted orally for centuries. Um, we believe the earliest was composed around 1500 BCE. And what the Vedas are is essentially sort of like a series of hymns and ritual prescriptions uh, to various gods. And the Vedic gods look very similar to, like, say, the Greek and Roman gods in a lot of ways. Right? So, you know, all of, most of these gods, for example, represent natural forces. Right? We have a wind god, a storm god, a death god, um, sky gods. Um, even the, uh, the Vedic sun god, Surya, 
is represented as a guy driving a chariot across the sky, right? This look familiar? Yeah, it's just it's Helios of Greece, soul of Rome, right? Same thing, same concept. So, <clears throat> one thing that the Vedic religion did not offer was any sort of path to transcendence or salvation. It was, again, much like those other ancient world religions in which you basically just tried to appease the gods so they wouldn't stomp on you. Now, in the 5th and 6th centuries BCE, two new religions rise up in India. Gautama Buddha founds Buddhism and a guru named Mahavira founds a religion called Jainism. J-A-I-N-I-S-M. Is that Mahavira? Mahavira. M-A-H-A-V-I-R-A. J-A-I-N-I-S-M. So, has any, do any of you know anything about either of these two religions? Do any of you know anything about Buddhism or Jainism? I've never heard of Jainism. Pardon? Buddhism wants to reach enlightenment. Yeah, and how do you reach enlightenment as a Buddhist? Yeah, it's a, it's a religion of renunciation, right? The only way to achieve transcendence, to achieve enlightenment, is to let go of your earthly ties so that you can ascend into nirvana, right? Without anything holding you back, anything holding you down. And Jainism is really um, kind of similar. Um, and it's essentially like Jains reject things of the world as well. Um, in fact, Jain monks um, often live in hermitages, uh, they're strict vegans, um, often they don't wear any clothes, right? They reject all things of the world in order to avoid being tied down to it and stuck in the endless cycles of reincarnation. So what was, so what was Gandhi? Well, he was like a fruitarian or something, wasn't he? Ga Gandhi, uh, Gandhi, was, uh, Gandhi was a Hindu. Um, I don't, I don't know about his, I, I, I think he, as far as I know, he was a vegetarian. I don't know much else about his diet. Um, but this is way, way, way free Gandhi, right? So what, is, what these religions are offering that the Vedic religion doesn't, right, is a way out. In your lifetime. Yeah. Essentially, you're not just tied to these kinds of endless cycles of rebirth that are described in the Vedas. So, as the Vedic religion starts losing ground to these other religions, by about the third century BCE, this is where we see the developments of what will become modern Hinduism. On the one hand, we see organized states forming, particularly in northern India, where previously most people sort of lived in kind of tribal confederations. And these organized states put in place a fairly strict system of varnas, or what we call castes. Anybody know anything about the Indian caste system? Anybody ever heard of this before? Okay, secret, what do you know about it? Well, I don't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you remember it from like a social studies class or yeah. something? Okay, yeah, Frank. Um, basically, if you're born into a caste, you, there's no social mobility unless you mm -hmm. marry down and then you marry down into that caste. Yep. There are like the priests on the top who are the Brahmin. Mm -hmm. Then there's the um, warrior caste. Yep. Then there's like the um, teachers, the uh, artisans, or since you know you're 
middle class typecast, correct? Uh huh. Then you have your, you know, farmers, unskilled laborers below that. And then you have the undesirables, those who take out trash, who clean away waste. You're not supposed to touch them, apparently. Uh huh. Okay, what is that second half? Kshatriya. K S H A T R I Y A. V A I S H Y A S. So yeah, so there are four casts, and yeah, they they pretty much are as Frank described them, right? The Brahmins are the top castes. The Brahmins are the priestly and intellectual caste. So priests and scholars form the top caste in society. The Kshatriya are warriors and rulers. So essentially the Kshatriya exist so that the Brahmins don't have to sully their hands with worldly things. Right? They can take care of political, political leadership and warfare so the Brahmins can concentrate on higher spiritual matters. Below the Kshatriya are the Vaishyas, the most varied caste, um, merchants, educated professionals, um, lawyers, medical doctors, people of that sort would belong to this particular caste. And the lowest caste are the Shudras, who are sort of general unskilled laborers, mostly agricultural. Right, skilled artisans would belong to the Vaishya class. Shudras are just sort of your people who do sort of average grunt work. Can you spell that one? S-H-U-D-R-A-S. And S-U-D-R-A-S. And outside of the caste system, again, as Frank was mentioned, are people who are called Dalit, D-A-L-I-T. They do not have a caste. They do sorts of work that would be considered spiritually polluting, um, touching dead bodies, for example, um, cleaning out sewers, things of that nature. Um, and it is, yeah, um, someone who has a caste is not supposed to associate with a Dalit. Now, the caste system in modern India is technically illegal, but it's really hard to stamp out centuries old practices and belief systems. So these sorts of, so these practices do still persist, particularly in uh, more rural, less cosmopolitan areas. Um, there was an incident a few years ago, actually, um, a group of students uh, at a university who were themselves born into castes uh, objected to having one of their classes taught by a Dalit professor. And so they took the guy outside and beat him. So sometimes, you know, these, these things have nasty consequences even sort of today. But this is a way of organizing society, and these are sort of grades that you are supposed to ascend through on your way up to enlightenment, right? So Hinduism does not promise you salvation in a single lifetime, right? You can't get there. You have to go through cycles of reincarnation, but if you follow what's called the Dharma, or prescribed duty, for your caste, then when you are reborn again, you will move up the ladder, right? And there are actually, you know, things that are higher than a Brahmin. There are certain animal forms that are considered higher than a Brahmin. Um, you know, eventually you work your way up to a god form. And the important gods in Hinduism are no longer the old Vedic gods. They're not as big a deal. The gods who become particularly important 
in Hinduism are known as the Trimurti. T-R-I-M-U-R-T-I. So there are three of them. Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. Brahma creates the world. Vishnu preserves it for a time. And Shiva destroys it. No. These are all uh, male principles. In fact, really they're all the same God. Right? They're just three faces of the same being. So Brahma creates the world. Vishnu holds it together for a while. Intervenes when there's a, you know, some sort of universe level threat. And Shiva, when the world has run its course, destroys it so Brahma can create another one, right? So they're all essential parts of the cycle. And the world we live in now, according to Hindu belief, is only one of many worlds that have been and will be, right? Eventually this world will run its course, Shiva will destroy it, Brahma will make a new one, just as, as has been happening for endless eons. Bless you. Okay. So, <clears throat> what does all of this have to do with this particular poem? What is Arjuna's caste? If he's a warrior, what caste does he belong to? Yeah. Arjuna, and technically all of his brothers, uh, though they actually, each brother represents a different caste's values. Yudhisthira is... Um, a sort of an a sort of an ideal Brahmin, Bhima is an ideal Shudra, and Nakula and Sahadeva are ideal Vaishyas. They're all technically Kshatriya, though. They're the sons of a king. So, as a Kshatriya, as indeed the ideal Kshatriya, Arjuna's duty is to fight in a just war, right? And the reasons for this war have been judged by the gods just, right? The Pandavas' cousins, the Karavas, who are led by a guy named Duryodhana. There are a hundred brothers, as opposed to the five Pandavas. Okay, so there are a hundred Karavas as opposed to simply five Pandavas. And they are, they have dispossessed the Pandavas of their inheritance. Right, the Pandavas have been kicked out of the family territory, even though they're the rightful rulers. They've been sent into exile, and the Karavas set a bunch of conditions for them. They said, well, okay, if you meet these particular conditions, we'll let you come back and rule. So the five Pandava brothers go out, they meet all of these conditions, they come back, and Duryodhana says, yeah, no. No, I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to remain king. Um, you, can, you can go elsewhere. And so, to get their rightful kingdom back, the Pandavas go to war against the Paravas. And that's the situation at the beginning of the poem, right? Arjuna is about to engage in battle against his cousins and their allies. And their allies include a lot of other people who are related to him, a lot of other friends of his, a lot of other um, you know, teachers, companions of youth, and things like that. So <clears throat> to go back to the poem here, right? The 32nd, uh, little, little stanza 32 here in chapter 1, page 730. I have no wish for victory, nor for kingship and its pleasures. O Krishna, what good is kingship? What good even life and pleasure? 
Those for whose sake we desire kingship, pleasures, and enjoyments are now drawn up in battle lines, their lives and riches now abandoned. Fathers, grandfathers, sons, grandsons, my mother's brothers and the men who taught me in my youth, brothers and fathers-in-law, kinsmen all. Though they are prepared to slay us, I do not wish to murder them, not even to rule the three worlds, how much less one earthly kingdom. What joy for us in murdering Dhritarashtra's sons, O Krishna, for if we killed the, the, these murderers, evil like theirs would cling to us. Now what he's referring to there is a concept called karma. What's karma? Anybody familiar with karma? Yeah, karma literally means action. And essentially, the way karma works in Hindu belief, right, is that good actions generate a sort of aura of good around you, right? So if you're following your dharma, if you're following your duty, then the actions that proceed from you are good actions. If you are going against your dharma, if you're, go if you're doing bad things, naughty things, then you accumulate a sort of aura of evil that clings to you, right? And will drag you down the reincarnation ladder when you die. So he's worried here about accumulating bad karma by killing his relatives. So we cannot in justice slay our kinsmen, Dhritarashtra's sons, for having killed our people, how could we be pleased, O Madhava? Even if they, mastered by greed, are blind to the consequences of the family's destruction, of friendships lost to treachery, how are we not to comprehend that we must turn back from evil? The wrong done by this destruction is evident, O shaker of men. For with the family destroyed, its eternal laws must perish. And when they, and when they perish, lawlessness overwhelms the whole family. Whelmed by lawlessness, the women of the family are corrupted. From corrupted women comes the intermingling of classes. Such intermingling sends to hell the family and its destroyers. Their ancestors fall then, deprived of rice and water offerings. Those who destroy the family, who institute class mingling, cause the laws of family and laws of caste to be abolished. So what is he worried is going to happen if he goes to war against his relatives? Well, what does this suggest, what does his reluctance to fight suggest about what he views as the basic building block of society? What must be preserved? The family. The family. Everything else is built on the family, right? Does this look familiar? And the and the legendary. Yeah, this is very similar to that Greek oikos concept, right? very much like that Greek Oikos concept, where the family is the building block of society, and as long as the family is intact, everything, is go everything goes well and smoothly. But Arjuna suggests here that if the family breaks down, that'll break down the caste system by which society is organized. And if the system by which society is organized breaks down, right? Ancestors will be deprived of their rice and water offerings. Like even like the spirit world will be shaken by this, right? Even the afterlife is shaken by this. So we cannot allow this to happen. I can't fight. I cannot kill my relatives. When the family goes to war, the only possible result is total societal breakdown. And how does Krishna respond to this? Does Krishna seem to think that Arjuna's concerns are valid? No, though you seem to speak wisely. Uh-huh. You have mourned those not to be mourned. The wise do not grieve for those gone or for those who are not yet gone. There was no time when I was not nor you, nor these lords around us. And there will never be a time, henceforth, when we shall not exist. So what is Krishna suggesting here about all of these people around Arjuna? What is he suggesting about the soul? 
that are going to be valid. Even though, like, he's, he doesn't want to kill them, even if he does kill them, they're not going to die. Yeah. Can one person actually kill another person? No, they'll just be in the system. Yeah. The soul is eternal, right? You can kill someone's body, but it's like stripping them of a suit of clothes. He is not, by the way, advocating wholesale murder here, right? You know, virtually all societies across the world regard murder in cold blood as, as an evil action. But what he is saying is that if you are fighting in a war in a just cause, then you should not worry that your actions bring evil upon you, right? You cannot actually kill the people you are so worried about killing, right? They will be back. You can't destroy their souls. The soul is eternal. The embodied one passes through childhood, youth, and then old age, then attains another body. In this, the wise are undeceived. Contact with matter by which we feel cold, heat and cold, pleasure and pain are transitory, come and go. These you must manage to endure. Such contacts do not agitate a wise man, O bull among men. To whom pleasure and pain are one, he is fit for immortality. Non-being cannot come to be, nor can what is come to be not. The certainty of these sayings is known by seers of the truth. So, nothing that exists can ever actually be destroyed. Well, what is, what is Krishna? Okay, yeah, unless, well, right, she, Shiva will break down the whole universe when it runs its course. But there's nothing a human being is actually capable of destroying. Whatever you kill, whatever you break, right, you haven't destroyed its essence. All things are part of a sort of world soul that is called Brahman or Atman. This translates from Sanskrit to something like Godhead. And to give you an example of how this operates or what this looks like, let's turn um, towards the end of this. Chapter 11. Page 742. Arjuna said, As a result of your kindness, in speaking of that greatest secret, recognized as the Supreme Self, I have been left undiluted. I have in detail heard you speak of creatures' origins and ends, and of your eternal greatness, O one of lotus petal eyes. This is just as you have spoken about yourself, O Supreme Lord. I desire to behold your lordly form, O Supreme Spirit. If you think it is possible for me to see this, then, O God, O Lord of Yoga, allow me to behold your eternal self. The blessed Lord said, O son of Pritha, look upon my hundredfold, no thousandfold forms, various and celestial, forms of diverse shapes and colors. Behold the Adichas and Vasus, the Rudras, Ashvins, and Maruts, many unseen previously. Behold these wonders, Arjuna. Here behold all the universe, beings moving and motionless, standing as one in my body, and all else that you wish to see. Because you are unable to behold me with your mortal eye, I give you one that is divine. Behold my majestic power. And after saying this, O King, Vishnu, the great Lord of Yoga, revealed his supreme, majestic form to him, the son of Pritha. That form has many eyes and mouths, and many wonders visible, with many sacred ornaments and many sacred weapons raised. Clothed in many sacred wreaths and garments, with many sacred fragrances, and comprising every wonder, the infinite omniscient God. If in the sky a thousand suns should have risen all together, the brilliance of it would be like the brilliance of that great souled one. And then the son of Pandu saw the universe standing as one, divided up in diverse ways, embodied in the God of gods. So when 
Krishna reveals his divine form to Arjuna, what does it comprise? What does Arjuna see? Many different forms. Many different forms. Yeah, he sees everything, right? So what does that indicate about the Hindu God concept? What is God? Everything. Yeah, God is everything and everything is God. Everything is part of this wider system that works together. Everything is part of God. This uh, is a belief system we often uh, in the West refer to as pantheism. Anybody uh, ever heard this term before? Anybody know what pantheism is? Okay, pantheism is, the, the, um, well, if we break the word down, um, theos is Greek for what? God, yes, good. What about Pan? Pan actually means every, all or everything. So we use the word pantheism to describe belief systems that believe that God is in everything. And here, yeah, we see a system where everything is a part of this kind of Godhead or world soul. And how does Arjuna respond to seeing this? How does this go for him? He kind of freaks out about it. And he, he asks for uh -huh. to return back to, the, to his human state. And he doesn't listen to it. Yeah, so th thank you very much. Um, you know, you've shown me what no mortal has ever seen. But um, this is freaking me the hell out, right? Does his hair turn white after this? Um, doesn't appear to, but um, maybe, I don't know. The, the, the epic does not say. But yeah, I mean, you know, imagine that you, you know, your friend just like opened up his chest and showed you the universe, right? How would you respond? How would that make you feel? I'd probably start screaming. Yeah. I mean, he's given Arjuna, you know, this kind of sacred eye to be able to take it in and handle it, right? But, it's, you know, what does this show Arjuna about himself? Small, motivated. Yeah. You know, look, you are, you know, you are a great warrior, right? A great hero. But in the grand scheme of the entire universe, you're just one small man. Right, you are just one tiny part of an enormous system. And your own personal quibbles, your own personal problems, from a cosmic standpoint, are relatively tiny. So what you need to think about is not, woe is me, you know, I have to fight my relatives. What you need to do is act within this system to preserve the system itself, right? To preserve divine balance. You are fighting in a just cause. You're fighting your cousins for land that they took from you. You tried every peaceful means to get it back. And still, they held it back from you. You're a warrior. That's your place in the system. And if you don't fight, that's what causes the system to break down, not battles between relatives, right? So essentially, what over the whole course of the poem, what Krishna is encouraging Arjuna to do is not to think of himself as part of the small system that is the family but to think of himself as part of the larger system that is the whole universe. 
Now this is what you know he, you know, he talks about acting without attachments. If we go back um, to page 738. know that action comes from Brahman, right? Action comes from this Godhead or world soul. Brahman comes from the eternal. So the all-pervading Brahman is based in sacrifice forever. One who in this world does not turn the wheel, thus setting it in motion, lives uselessly, O son of Pritha, a sensual, malicious life. But the man whose only pleasure and satisfaction is the self, which is his sole contentment too, has no task he must accomplish. That man finds no significance in what has or has not been done. Moreover, he does not depend on any being whatsoever. So what the poet is doing here is taking a shot at those renunciate religions, right? At Buddhism, at Jainism, at these religions that encourage people to reject the world, and thus, as the poet would have it here, reject action, right? They don't turn the wheel, right? By refusing to do anything, by refusing to act in the world, they behave selfishly. They're only concerned with their own path out. They're only concerned with their own afterlives and not with the system as a whole. Therefore, act without attachment in whatever situation for by the practice of detached action, one attains the highest. Only by action, Janaka and the others reach perfection. In order to maintain the world, your obligation is to act. Whatever the best leader does, the rank and file will also do. Everyone will fall in behind the standard such a leader sets. O son of Pritha, there is not that I need do in the three worlds, nor anything I might attain, and yet I take part in action. For if I were not always to engage in action ceaselessly, men everywhere would soon follow in my path, O son of Pritha, right? Because Krishna is a god. So if Krishna sets a bad example by refusing to act, then human beings will say, ah, oh, the gods do nothing. I can do nothing as well. Just as the soldiers following Arjuna will say, right, our leader does nothing. Therefore, we too throw down our arms, right? The superior person is supposed to set an example for others. Should I not engage in action, these worlds would perish utterly. I would cause a great confusion and destroy all living beings. The unwise are attached to action even as they act Arjuna. So for the welfare of the world, the wise should act with detachment. So who or what is Krishna? Just so everybody's clear on that. Do you all understand what Krishna is? He is a god, yeah. Specifically, he's an emanation, a sort of physical manifestation of one of these three gods. Yeah. He's what's called an avatar of Vishnu, the preserver. So he's a physical, like Vishnu, in order to remove some sort of threat to the universal system will sometimes take a physical form and come to earth to face that threat. Krishna is one of those forms. And everybody else in the epic seems to understand that that's what he is, right? Everybody that he associates with understands that Krishna is, uh, is not a person, he's a god. Even so, right, he and Arjuna address each other more or less as equals and are, you know, like best friends from childhood. So, you know, good for Arjuna being best buddies with a god. What's that? He's a demigod, technically. Yeah, actually, yeah, Arjuna is himself a demigod, so you're right. But, so, much of Krishna's message here, right, regarding action, is that when you act, you should not worry about the consequences of that action for yourself, right? Acting without attachment 
right? You act without, you act according to your duty, according to your dharma, the dharma that is prescribed for your particular class, without hope of personal gain, without worrying about what you yourself will get from it. So <clears throat> what Krishna is trying to explain to Arjuna is like, look, you are not just fighting with your cousins over a parcel of land, right? This is part of a larger universal struggle, right? Your cousins have violated the law of Dharma. They've violated their duty. And it's up to you and your brothers to correct this and to set things right. This is what the gods have decided. Is this starting to make any more sense to you now? Yeah. Okay. And yeah, I mean, and I, I know like, this is coming from a completely unfamiliar context to most of you. Um, there are some similarities with Greek and Roman belief, but mostly in what's being rejected, right? Mostly in what's being tossed aside. I mean, what we are seeing here is kind of the invention of a new religious system in response uh, to threats to an older religious system. So, oh yeah, we can give you a path to salvation too. It's going to take longer. Um, but, you know, you're supposed to climb through each of these ranks and gain enlightenment in each of these ranks in order to ascend. As opposed to destination. Exactly. Yeah. It is. Yeah. I, I, that's that's a good way to put it. It's actually a, more of a journey-based religion. It, it's it's more about how much you experience than it is about getting yourself out of the cycle. So, does anybody have any more questions about this? Anything that you're still unclear on, or anything that you're that you're concerned about? Arjuna is one of the Pandavas, right? Their enemies are the Kauravas. And actually, at the end of the battle, um, the only survivors are the five Pandava brothers. Krishna's a god, of course, so he, you know, can't, he can't be killed by human beings. Um, and one of the Kauravas' allies. So yeah, pretty uh, pretty massive epic battle. If you're interested in the whole thing, um, I have actually posted on Georgia View um, two episodes of an Indian television series based on the Mahabharata. Um, that the the two episodes cover uh, the Bhagavad Gita, basically, um, and there are there are subtitles, right? Mm -hmm. It's in Hindi, but there are subtitles. So, you know, you won't be completely lost as to what's going on. Um, but yeah, it might, you know, if you, want, if you have time and you want to watch it, it might give you a little, like, the two episodes together are probably about 90 minutes long. All right, any other questions? I've got kind of an off the wall one. Yeah, go ahead. Why does he call him Oh, handsome hair? Oh, um, it's because Krishna is usually depicted uh, with long flowing hair. Okay, that's what I want. Um, yeah, it's, it, it's just an epithet that's attached to the god. Yeah, that's, that's all. Yes? So the Kauravas, they broke their promise to the That's correct. Yep, the Kauravas are not the rightful rulers of the territory. And they're keeping the rightful rulers of the territory from actually taking charge. And that throws, the entire, that throws the entire system out of balance. And so the war is necessary from the perspective of the gods in order to set that balance right. Anything else? OK, so I hope that this will help set you up um, pretty well for what we're looking at next time. Um, we're going to be reading some Chinese philosophy. Uh, we're going to be looking at the Analects of Confucius. 
So you will probably see some similarities between the system Confucius is setting up and the system that we get in the Bhagavad Gita. Um, so once the reading questions are here, take what you need. And then we are adjourned. And as I said, I'll have your exams back for you uh, next time. <laughs>